So uh, this is a very exciting guest for me. He's one of my best friends. Uh, one of the reasons I wanted to do the show in the first place was to take a walk down his discography. Welcome oh, to yes. Dive, Andy Biersack. I'm here. I'm uh, I'm I'm looking at I'm looking at your uh, your your table or what would you call it a bookcase back there? It's Certainly it's, not a table. It's my it's I'm, my I library. I guess I'm unfamiliar with uh, furniture. That's my main issue, and that's what we should mostly get into today. Is that I can't think of the word for furniture. But I will say uh, I'm a big fan of the way it looks. Like it looks it looks like uh, if if I were playing a video game of Downey's life. That's what that's what I would imagine Downey's house in the video game would look like. Yeah, the, those are various accessories too that you would grab and you might need yeah. for different points in the journey. No, it's it's good to be here. I'm uh, I'm excited to be here and do this with you. Obviously, we've talked about this for a long time since you started doing the show, so I'm happy to get into it. Yeah. So does my hair look like it's 500 feet tall because it does in the in the in this like it, it looks it's just bigger and bigger. The problem is I got my hair cut last week. I was really happy with it. My hair grows really fast. So now the spiking up portion is just getting out of control. And you uh, had to, uh, mine grows fast as well, which is a good problem to have, I guess, um, as we approach, you know, I don't want to say middle age, but wherever, wherever either one of us is in the generational scale, the fact that we have this much hair, we shouldn't complain about. But getting a haircut right now is a good idea because uh, you might not be able to again in a couple of weeks. That's what they were saying That's at my true. barber shop yesterday. I just, I, just saw, I just saw the deal of uh, their closing stuff, so. We'll see. Yeah. Maybe um, I'll just do it myself. I, I can just go back to that. But yeah, right now my hair is like 75 feet tall. It's uh, I look a little bit like like the punk rock Frankenstein. Well, there is a... Uh, yeah, it would be great for the Downey video game behind me. You have a Kirk Hammett, Hammett book. You have the Erie Vaughn book. And before too long, that bookshelf is going to have the Andy Beersack book. That's true. That is true. So, the uh, the physical copy, or you can just print out the pages and put it on there yourself. <laughs> yeah, I could do I could do that literally right now. Yeah, you could. Uh, you know, one of the reasons why I like having a bookshelf behind me is the old John Waters quote that uh, you know, if if you ever go home with someone and they don't have books, don't sleep with them. Okay. All right. Well, Absolutely. I I don't have any books behind me, uh, but you know, hopefully it's uh, hopefully Julia doesn't come in and change your opinion of me. <laughs> um I'll, we'll, I'll keep that between us so right. what was your first experience in a recording studio my first experience in a recording studio was in 2006 uh it was in i think it's called deer park it's a neighborhood uh in the northern part of cincinnati um near what used to be called forest fair mall which i recently learned because uh, of the internet has just been left to uh, become part of nature. Like it's, it's <laughs> just, it was abandoned and then they just let it go. And so like all the things that were in there now are just like way creepier than they should be. Like there's like a, I saw pictures where it's like the food court has like, you know, trees and shit growing in it. And there's like a, uh, the, you know, the kids rides and stuff. Also where I saw Pinocchio, uh, the live action Pinocchio that came out, uh, in the late nineties in theaters, uh, on a school trip. And I also discovered my love of junior mints that day. So it was, it was a banner day for me, but no, so we, uh, we recorded at this place. It was right catty corner to that also catty corner to a Christian rock venue called the underground, uh, in Cincinnati, which was a venue that black club rides was never allowed to play. Not because we had done anything particularly anti-Christian, but because there was just a safe assumption that we weren't the right kind of band to be playing at the underground. Um, and they just made, they made that call on their own. Uh, so, but so there was a venue or there was a, a studio that I think one of the people who was in the band at the time had discovered online or, you know, City Beat or whatever, kind of, however you used to find shit. Uh, Cause it wasn't like we really necessarily were Googling thing. I mean, you could, but I don't know that we were even finding things that way. We were still going by the, the old way of like looking in the back of City Beat and trying to find a, a place to record music. Um, but so we went there. We had we had pulled the money to be able to record. I think it was three songs, two or three songs, and uh, everything about it now, in retrospect, was what you might call extra. Like <laughs> the way that the the gentleman who owned the place treated the whole proceedings was like we were entering like you know the whatever Sound City or like it was mm -hmm. it was a very like way too fancy of a lobby area, way too many snacks, way like. All things considered, it was like 
it was like this guy's life dream to have a studio and to be treated like the king of a studio. And uh, we were just sort of, we were experiencing his, his, his uh, dream with him. Um, but it was fine. We recorded the song. Um, I was enamored of like all the sounds that you could make, you know, like discovering Pro Tools and how you could make noises happen. And so I, I was asking like, well, could, could we make it sound like a helicopter or could we make it sound like an explosion? Um, and he said, yes. And so all of those things ended up in those songs. Uh, and so like at the end, there's a song called Devil For Me which, um, and the other thing that's it's interesting about those songs is that I was not yet uh, a lyricist. I, I was, I, I didn't know how to write. The songs that I was writing at the time were um, primarily like horror punk songs about like zombie girlfriends and things like that. You know, I, I didn't have any experience writing uh, songwriting. And I wasn't, I was very, obviously I was 15 or something at the time. And the old, the other guys who were in that iteration of the band were much older, um, not much older. I mean, they were probably eighteen, nineteen. Uh, which, when you're, there was, which, when you're fifteen, is like a world. I mean, when I was yeah, 15, had, I was in a band with somebody who was seventeen, and it seemed like he was a hundred. You know, whereas much more life you get older, and they it becomes things. less. Yeah, and, they, and yeah, and they were able to to talk about things that I didn't know. They had drank, they had partied, they smoked cigarettes. They were all these things that I had no experience with. And so um, basically what happened was ultimately I didn't wind up writing any of those songs that were recorded that day. And the funny thing is a lot of people think that I have. And if you read the lyrics, they don't read at all like anything that I've written since. Um, so Devil For Me, Hello My Hate. And uh, I think that was the only two. So we did two. I think that was it. I think those are the two songs. Uh, and then later we did other songs in a different city. But I think the first time around it was two songs. But I didn't write either of those. Uh, oh, Sex in Hollywood. That's it. That's the third one. Um, which is what, and this is not to be uh, mean, but which is what a like a 17 or 18 year old in Northern Kentucky imagined Hollywood would be like, right? Uh, based on based on movies and television. Um, but again, I was so excited about it because I thought, yeah, cool. Like uh, there was a there was like a Murder Dolls song called like Dead in Hollywood, and uh, I remember thinking, oh, that's kind of similar to that or something like that. But so I didn't write those lyrics. And I didn't really have any personal affinity for it. I just thought, well, I super want to have a band and these songs are cool enough. So we, we recorded those songs. People to this day ask like, well, where are those songs? And I'm like, well, I didn't even fucking, I didn't write those songs. Like, I have, <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, but because of the internet, they've lived on in different iterations over the years. Uh, like, where are those songs? So, Six feet under the ground where they belong. <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, it's not, uh, for those of you who are fans of it, uh, I don't, I'm not disparaging the songs in general. I mean, they're, it's just that I have no real personal connection with them because, you know, I, I was, I didn't write them. Uh, and I don't, I don't really know what they're about. Like, I, I couldn't tell you what uh, a devil for me is about. No, you know what? I did. I, I, I'm, now I'm getting it wrong. I did write, I wrote the chorus to a devil for me. Maybe I wrote, I wrote the most on a devil for me. So that's the one that I wrote the most on hello my eight i wrote absolutely nothing on sex in hollywood i think i wrote some of the verses on uh or, or pieces of it so i was involved but not to the degree that i would later become where by the time black Veil brides makes even the the iteration that did we stitch these wounds or morticians daughter or those kind of songs where i was the one writing the lyrics and coming up with the concepts um so yeah that was my first experience with those couple songs and then we put them out on uh, like a CD and try to get them on MySpace. And I remember going to like cdbaby.com or whatever the fuck it was and getting them onto iTunes. And that was it. That was like the beginning. And I didn't, the funny thing is that literally none of, I didn't like any of the songs. Like I, I was not a fan of any of them, but it was the only material that we had and they didn't sound very good, but it was like, well, this is, this is it. I gotta, you know, if I'm going to get to the next ring, which is to make more songs, I have to start with some songs. So that's kind of how it all started. And you had recorded yourself before at this point, whether it was, you know, videos for MySpace and, and that sort of thing. Well, I had a little Sony multi-track recorder thing, digital multi-track recorder. And we would set up, any version of the band would set up usually in like my garage or in the, the, the kitchen. My parents let me take the, the table out of the kitchen and use that as a rehearsal space in the house, uh, which is a unique place to, to rehearse. Um, but so yeah, they would let me do that and then we'd record in there. And then sometimes I would use a little, uh, handheld video camera and then record us and then put those on MySpace or the very early version of YouTube. But, um, 
the and and those songs were primarily covers the first thing i released in my life was beer sack which was the first iteration of black Veil brides and it was uh three covers on and then i put on cd and this is when i was in say my freshman year of high school and i did all the artwork on ms paint on the computer and uh i i went to best buy and bought like cd labels and we printed out every single one and it was so much fucking ink and i would smear the ink trying to put the labels on the cds and get the but then I and then I would go to school and I'd hand them out and tell them this is this new band that's coming and it's going to be the biggest band ever. And it was uh, the guitar player's sister's name was Sherry, so we renamed Sadie to Sherry, uh, which is the Alkaline Trio song, and then Wait for the Blackout, which is the, by the Damned, and uh, fuck if I know the third one, Hybrid Moments maybe or some kind of hate. I mean, some kind those of hate. are pretty cool. Like they're, they're way worse bands and songs for kids to have covered yeah i think i was most proud of the some kind of hate cover that's the one that i think was the best of the audio recordings on a little digital recorder i mean and also i didn't know how to play bass uh so i just made up bass lines to play and it was like in 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 sadie in particular it's just absolute lunacy it's like <laughs> i'm just playing whatever and you can hear it loudly because it's coming out of this little like combo fuzz amp and so bling 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 um those songs exist somewhere online i don't encourage anyone to listen to them but they do exist um and so that was the first release i had but the studio experience was the uh the the what became the sex and hollywood ep so yeah but so you weren't unfamiliar with the idea of hearing your own voice back but but you were unfamiliar with being in a air quotes stu- professional studio we i mean you know from the time i was four years old or five years old I was hearing my voice back because I would make everyone film me doing the entire soundtrack of the Phantom of the Opera or Sweeney Todd or the Kiss greatest hits whatever it was and I would just sing in the living room and then it would be a show that everyone had to watch little little Johnny Rockenfield little Johnny Rickfield yeah Uh, I always (laughs) the the Rick Springfield mashup uh sometimes I mash in the wrong spot so I don't know how I mashed it, you know, at that age. But again, I don't know why I loved the name Rick Springfield so much, but I did. And I thought, a, this is going to be it. It's a good name. It's, but I, mean, I did know it. I knew that I was little. And so I put that in there. You and know, like you, he was, he was a singer actor. He was on a yeah. television show. He did rock music. You know, there's some, there's continuity. Maybe, maybe there's more to Rick Springfield's influence on me than we've ever gotten. <laughs> uh, that, that's the next episode. So we are speaking on the occasion of the imminent release of Restitch These Wounds. So mm-hmm. as we go through your discography, your first real official record full length was We Stitch These Wounds. Right. What was that recording experience like? I've talked about it a lot recently because that's sure. part of you know talking about this. But the truth is, um, I don't have a lot of vivid memories of it like the way that you're supposed to, right? The way that you're supposed to remember um, your first record and how exciting it is. I was so, it was like the record was in service of the the greater plan, right? And because I knew that we didn't have the money to make it sound the way we wanted to, and because I knew that the studio we were recording in was subpar, the hours we had to keep were weird. A lot of that process is more to, I remember more of like sitting in a room planning. You know what I mean? Because I get the mixes back and I go, yeah, it's not that great, but we'll do the best we can. Like, we'll keep going. Mm-hmm. We're going to keep pushing. Um, so, I mean, we recorded it in a jingle studio. A studio that's primarily used for, like, commercial jingles and things like that in L.A. Um, and the guys who wasn't. were engineering it were working on more important things by day. They were, right they were working, in. yeah. Yeah. Blasco was, was the producer in the sense that you know he was the guy that would come in and go like move this do this but you know he wasn't it, it, and it's, not, it's no fault of his it wasn't like he was he was uh like a a feldy situation where he's like you know there at the beginning of the day whatever you know what i mean it was more like here let's just make sure that you guys he gave us the reins and gave me the opportunity to just kind of make the record the way that i thought it should be made and gave the guitar players the opportunity to write what they wanted you know what i mean and then he would come and we'd listen in the car basically to what we were doing. And he would say, this is good or bad. Um, but the, the two engineers, uh, 
Preston Babel, G. Preston Babel, and uh, and Josh Newell, wonderful guys who are, do incredible work. But you know, they were they were working with a little bit of a rusty toolbox when it came to this record. They were both working on other records. One in particular was working all day and into the nights on a Lincoln Park record that was being made at the same time at a studio down the street. And then he'd get off work late. And basically that would be when I'd get the call at like 11 p.m. or, or midnight or 1 a.m. All right, it's time to do vocals. So then I'd go and the only available room might be the like sub closet outside the, the tracking room to track vocals. So I'd go in there and do vocals in there. And some in some cases I'm writing the melodies on the fly because we don't have enough songs done yet. So like a song like Never Give In, the melodies are terrible on that song, but I'm also just writing them as I'm singing the lines. Like I'm writing everything and going like, it's, you know, trial and error as I'm tracking. So there were parts of that that uh, were very exciting. I can remember um, someone who is no longer in the band, uh, and this was even before we started Wretched, and, or before we started We Stitch These Wounds, um, saying to me that this band doesn't have the magic uh, that you're supposed to have when you're in this era. Like every great band has a story for their first record and there's no story for this record. And I remember thinking like, well, I don't really give a shit about that. Cause I'd imagine that in the future, uh, there will be a story. And here we are, you know, 10 years later, sure. there is a story. You were not incorrect. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean, the story is it's a, it's a young band that had an audience based on a few little factors that was growing kind of underground and it was time for us to make a record. And we had a very limited budget on a very small independent subsidiary label. And we did our best. And literally from the time I can remember, we went to El Torito in what used to be El Torito in Burbank. And it was before the record was even out. And we had, our sales had done so well at, uh, at Hot Topic and retail stores, Spencer's, that kind of thing, but primarily Hot Topic that, we were being courted by major labels and we had a meeting with one of the majors uh, near that, where that restaurant was. And I remember sitting in the car outside of that restaurant and listening to the record before it was even out, just going like, this is not, this does not sound good. Like this is not, you know, the, the songs I was very proud of and everything, but I, and I would, I remember I would drive around LA and I would try to put myself in the position of someone who had never heard it before. And is this record, it does this record sound like what I, what the message that I want to give or the intended sonics. And, and this is not to be, not to me meant to be disparaging against the record or anybody who enjoyed it, but really from the moment that the record was complete to now, it never fit for really any of us the way that it was supposed to. It never sounded the way we wanted it to. It was never as big as we wanted it to be. It was never the statement that we wanted it to be. However, it, you know, it succeeded. And, uh, you know, it's to the degree to that remember I... that this is a band and a concept and an ideology and, and all this, this sort of thing at this point already that you had conceived of from a very young age and were clawing and scraping to make real. So when you're hearing that recording back for, for the first few times, of course, you're, you're let down because it's not, you have this grand ambition and it hasn't yeah. been executed. Well, and, you know, we always it always felt like particularly in the early years that we were, we were never the band that got the shiny thing. You know, we were, we always had to fight for gloss and pomp and circumstance and all, all the things that just came along with being a band that was signed that we saw so many of our peers get. We never had that. You know, if we wanted something done, we had to do it. There was never, because we were never darlings of any kind of scene, we never had like, our first record wasn't a big budget, glossy, beautiful sounding record. Our first music videos weren't millions of dollar budget videos. Our, you know, and, and I don't mean first as in before we got signed, but once we were signed, and once we were a band that was touring the world, we were still the only ones who, outside of our fan base that believed in, in this as much as we did, you know? And that, and that was, and that went on for a long time. And even to this day, I think that that's one of the things about the band that maybe has been the coolest thing is that we've been, in many ways, we've done a lot of things just on our own, you know. Uh, you know, I made the artwork for the American skin. You know what I mean? Like, that's, like, that's those, it, 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 never, it never really occurs to us as much as maybe it does other bands to, like, pass off things. It's a lot of, like, well, this is what we want to do, we'll just do it. 
Um, and so that ethic kind of started then and it, it, it pissed me off and it kind of even furthered the like, well, we'll just do it on our own and we'll show everybody then. This record that nobody thought was worth enough money or nobody thought to take the time on, it's going to succeed and then we'll go to the next one and it'll be bigger and better. And, you know, it's kind of the, the trajectory of everything started there. So going into the next record then, which the situation could not be any more different in that you have, you know, you're on a major label now. Um, the band is much more established, is, you know, blowing up for lack of a better phrase. When you go to make Set the World on Fire, what state were those songs in? Because the first record, of course, has songs from different eras and different iterations of the band prior to even getting there, and then songs that you were finishing in the studio. What what was the the uh, the state of the songs when you went to make Set the World on Fire? Were they all so, ready to go? Yeah, so first, or? Uh, we Stitch These Wounds is a, a combination of a lot of things. It is songs that Jake and Jinx had written prior to knowing me that I either wrote top line on or I took, like We Stitch These Wounds is the song that existed in a different iteration. And then it just so happens that Jake and Jinx had a song that sounded very similar that I could literally just sing my lyrics and melody over with a few changes. So a lot of those songs started that way. Set the World on Fire, it was full, let's dig through every Jake and Jinx and CC demo. Because they had worked together previously prior to being in the mm -hmm. band. There was all these, I mean, that's why that record is so shreddy too, is because a lot of them were musical pieces that were written without the idea of having a melody over them. You know, the, the, a lot of those songs were literally like the idea was here's a, a, like a three and a half minute four minute long guitar solo that's impossible mm -hmm. to play you know and then then it came to well let, now let's write over it and so it really isn't until you get to wretched and divine that we started doing from scratch original material that didn't exist anywhere set the world on fire is primarily with the few exceptions songs that were musical compositions that then lyrics and melody were, were written on top of and in that instance, um, this is now, I'm no longer the guy who, who doesn't drink and everything else. Now I am a couple, a year and a half or two years into touring. Uh, I'm drinking every day. I'm told by the producer that I sound better when I'm drunk uh, tracking. So I, you know, at being 20, 21 years or 20 years old at the time, I take that as gospel. So I go, great. So I would, I would show up to the studio every day on that with a, uh, you know, boxed wine, I would take the bag out of the box and like throw it over my shoulder like, uh, like, uh, what do you call it? <laughs> like, like, a, like a hobo on a boxcar train. <laughs> yeah, it, well, it looked like uh, bagpipes. Like it was oh, like, you know, with yeah. a little like things. So like <laughs> and I would just drink that all day and then I'd go track and I'd write, and, you know, a lot of the lyrics, not all of it. I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to disparage the whole thing, but a lot of the lyrics on that record are a little bit of um, what I imagined uh, someone in my position would say. Do you know what I mean? Right. Like a, a few of the songs on there, I have almost no personal connection to because they have so little to do with how I actually felt and more of what what the expectation was. And because I was so young and there was influences of people who were more interested in heavy and hair metal and those kind of things, I started to kind of just want to lean into that because that was, you know, I wanted to be cool and I wanted to be uh, interesting and I, I wanted to have a mystique about me and all that kind of stuff. And so there's about half of that record to me is while I do enjoy it and I like the timeline of my life and I know it's an important record to our fan base, it, it holds less, the, the, re, the songs themselves in many cases hold less of a special place for me. Uh, and not all, but some of them, um, I don't have a whole lot of personal connection to because I don't feel like I was talking about anything. By the time we get to Wretched Divine, I, I had a clear vision for what I wanted to say how I wanted to say it, what I was saying, what the purpose of the songs were and what kind of ideas they were servicing within the context of the song. So, but yeah, I would say that Set the World on Fire and then into the Rebels EP, we, we discovered what the band would sound like if we had a big production. And we really leaned into that. I mean, we, I started reading about Mutt Lang and the, the wall of vocals mm -hmm. and, and how to make that sound and so, like I mean, a song 70 like, backing a song like, vocals on one. Yeah, a song like chorus. Legacy, yeah. a song like Legacy is almost comical in the chorus because there is, there's so many harmonies. I mean, every possible 
every possible note that could be put in as a harmony is in there. Uh, if you listen to those things isolated, the uh, Luke Walker, who is the gentleman who did all the backing vocals on that record, um, he's singing 100 times. And, and we would sit in the booth and laugh because, I mean, it was unbelievable how high he could go and how low. And so he's doing all the backup vocals on that and the Rebels EP. Uh, and then the band would do the gang vocals. And I mean, you can, it's sort of funny because you can kind of hear his tone. Sometimes people don't know who that voice is, but he's got a very specific tone. And so Rebel Love Song and Coffin and those other things, you're hearing his harmonies. And because I, at the time, I didn't know how to harmonize. I couldn't sing harmonies. It would take me forever to try to learn them. And I didn't have the range. So now on, on current records, uh, you know, on the most recent thing, I'm singing harmonies as is Lonnie, as is other members of the band. But moving forward, uh, I learned how to do it. And Feldy's the one who taught me how to do that. But at the time, there was nobody to teach me. I didn't know how to do it. So we just had this, this Luke Walker, co-producer of the record, singing all the backups and building this wall of vocals. And it was, it, I mean, I love it for what it is but it is sort of funny in retrospect. Like we would sit there for maybe an hour and go like, now the next harmony, now the next harmony, now the next harmony. And you could listen to them isolated and it sounds like Queen or something, but they're basically lost in the mix because there's no way to hear like the, the highest of high vocals in there. Yeah, and that's something I think a lot of fans probably don't realize about the way records are made, especially with big production, big budget, major label rock records, that having any number of other people coming in and doing harmonies and backup vocals. I mean, you know, those AFI records, uh, you know, Sing the Sorrow, December Underground, those records have a lot of other people. It's not, that's not all Davey Havoc and Jade. Um, yeah. You know, the guy from, well, and then the guy ultimately from Steel that, Panther that is, on the, is on one of those records. Um, well, for us, that turned into Feldy. Feldy has been, um, in all the Feldy records that we made, the high harmonies on all those records, the ones that I can't sing, that's John Feldman. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's just, and also to your point about there's so much stuff happening, you couldn't possibly hear it all. You know, that's something that you'll see, uh, you know, like when uh, Metallica did the classic album special on the Black album and they're sitting there with listening back to some of those mixes for the first time and, and they're finding things that they all had forgotten or even in there because they just, yeah. they didn't make it to the, you know. Yeah, right. there's so oh, many yeah, those are things. There. There's we things that I that, that I I know are in there, and I wish you could hear more, but maybe didn't get put put in the mix in, a, in enough of a way, or something that maybe I'll listen to it in here, but the average listener won't because they weren't there the day that we were putting that bell in there or that mm -hmm. chime or whatever it is, you know. So um, let's talk about the Rebels EP. You mentioned it, and that that was the stopgap release in between those two records. Um, Billy Idol. Billy Idol and Adam Ant were probably, those were the first two artists that I loved as a very young kid. And obviously you and I have, have bonded and talked about Billy Idol plenty of times in the past. And I know your dad's a Billy Idol fan. So of course I love Rebel Yell being on there. And everyone knows that Kiss is a big influence on Black Veil Brides. But in particular, I think it's important to point out that era that Unholy is from, that specific yeah. era of Kiss. And then for me as you know a fellow Kiss nerd, I love that that's a Vinnie Vincent co-write. That there's a yeah. Vinnie, so Vinnie Vincent's name appears on the Black Belt Brides record, which I that is very true. And and then something cool. And then the weirdest the weirdest part of that is that uh, that also that cover also features Zach Wilde playing right. the solo on that song. Yeah, um, which is awesome, but it's also just funny because in retrospect, you're like that's sort of random. Uh, yeah. But Zach, of course, is is uh, managed by the same manager as us, and has always been a big supporter of the band. And, he, at the time, he was like, hey, you guys want me to play on anything? And we were like, fuck yeah, we're doing this Kiss cover. Do you want to play on that? <laughs> uh, yeah, he's got a cool solo on there. But yeah, so that came as, there was there was an interest to do something else because the band had gained so much traction, particularly in the UK. We were really blowing up there. And we were kind of told like, well, let's do some more material. Let's get something else out there before your next run of shows. And so we went back into the same studio. We were not working with the producer uh from set the world on fire but it's the same studio and we were working with the engineer and the co-producer hmm. luke walker um so uh the the uh the, the dynamic was very similar and it felt like we were in the same space but it was a little bit different in the sense that we were it was more driven by the band you know those three songs and i think coffin to this day is is one of my favorite it's my favorite song of that era and it's one of my favorite songs of the band um i like the video that, too 
Yeah, and that was, I mean, it's just, it's one of those ones where, you know, you, you hear a song while you're writing it and you're like, oh, this is going to be good. Like, this is a good song. And, and that was that we all had the feeling right away. And we were coming off of um, touring a lot. And so I was thinking a lot about the where I lived, which was in a, essentially a year long living in a coffin rolling around on the road everywhere. And, you know, people telling us that uh, the band was, was a, a fad or that we didn't have the legs to go anywhere. We would hear a lot from older bands that, oh, you guys would be huge if you just had a song, like you don't have any songs. And so- uh, You got everything you need except for a song. Yeah. yeah, and so that song was a lot of like, well, you can't, you're not gonna be able to take this away from me. You know what I mean? Like uh, this thing that I'm doing now, this world that I live in, this is my thing. So um, yeah, I, I, I love that. There's nothing really remarkable about the experience there other than it was, it was a week and a half, two weeks of, of going in there and doing it. The Kiss song was important to me because Revenge was my first Kiss record that I own. And it's probably my favorite Kiss record. And I know that's it's not a popular opinion, but it's also, it came out in the mid-90s. I was the right age for it. You know what I mean? Like it's, time, place, it all and has to do with I say it. that yeah. all the time. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I mean, and, and then the Billy Idol cover, um, we, had, we had started playing that song, like rehearsing it, uh, and then possibly thought about playing on, on a tour. And we were kind of, it was one of those things where we knew how we would do it if we did it. So the recording of that was really quick. Um, and then embarrassingly uh, now, because I'm, I'm in a different place in my life, I used the, uh, the ad lib that Billy does, does live for the, uh, the second verse. And what I, at the time I was so excited because I did it that way. And then I remember him tweeting, I can't believe I heard this cover. I can't believe that they used the ad lib that I do live as opposed to the actual lyrics. Uh, and so that was funny, but yeah, I mean, the lyric itself is not the, not the greatest thing anyone's ever said. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, anyway. I mean, there, you know, yeah, I don't, I love those live ad libs though, cause it does show an extra level of, of fandom and of relationship to a song. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't hear creeping death anymore without hearing motherfucker in between die. Cause it's just, yeah, you know, that's just the way, yeah. you know, um, so that does bring us into Wretched. And I think that you hit upon something else important as a bridge in that, you know, you're talking about those earliest, earliest recordings in Ohio, not feeling connected to them lyrically. And then even in to set the world on fire, like some of those songs being more like what you, how you thought you were supposed to come off or what you thought you were supposed to feel. And then you just described Coffin as something that was very much like, that was exactly who you were right in that moment. That was exactly what you right. wanted to say. That's what you were thinking about. So that feels important to me in terms of a bridge between maybe the earlier era and then going into Wretched. Like you were- Yeah, I think by the time I got to that- voice I was, as a songwriter. Yeah, I was more confident as a lyricist in being able to, to say the things I was thinking in a way that felt accurate to my thoughts, but also felt poetic enough that it could be put in the context of a song and make sense and you could sing along to it and that kind of thing um you know and there there what that was present on set the world on fire in a lot of ways i think obviously savior is a song where savior took me i would say the lyrics took me 20 minutes if that because i knew exactly what i wanted to say and i just sat down and wrote it that way you know and then went and tracked it and that that is the case on a lot of songs but when it comes to wretched and divine we were we were finishing up the set the world on fire tour and i was I was a little unhappy with the direction that the band had taken. The success of the band had also built a level of um, expectation of what we were that I felt was not in concert with who I wanted the band to be. Um, and a lot of that was the uh, hair metal, uh, over-sexualization, um, a lot of the things that felt like they were not what I had grown up loving or what I had intended had taken place within the band and have started to get pushed to the forefront. And look, I, I'm not going to say that I wasn't uh, a member of the teasing your hair up and dressing like Motley Crue brigade. Like we, we were all there, but it felt but like you it was were, time. But you were Kiss, the Misfits, the Damned, Alkaline Trio, all these things people know and understand about you now and that were always present and you can see in any era you know, you weren't the, 
if there was a if Motley Crue is sort of you know when you think about those first two Crue records and the image of the band in that era prior to Theater of Pain, I think they're kind of a a bridge or a commonality between that horror punk and darker dark romantic stuff that you and I both love. Yeah. And then like well, the truth LA is, and you and I have talked about this. Or a warrant, but I never, you were never that guy that was. Well, I was never really warrant, into the Molly Crew discography, and that's right. the truth. You know, you right. and I have talked about that. I, 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 I'm admittedly, and I've said it before. I, I, I like and know the hits, but I, I was only ever introduced to the deep cuts of their albums via being in this band and being around people that were in, that enjoyed that kind of stuff. To me. I never, I had no interest in writing songs about getting laid and partying. Do you know what I mean? And that had been, the direction that the band was going in was a lot of, of the expectation was that's who we were. I was playing into that kind of in the way I would speak in interviews or the way that the, the look, and it just, I had just had enough. Um, you know, it just felt like what we were doing was no longer... Uh, the message that the band was meant to be at Restitch These Wounds and had gone so far into, we're a 80s hair metal glam, you know, sleazy band. And that's, again, I had zero interest in that. So we, we had finished the Set the World on Fire tour and I was just feeling like, I was happy that the band was successful and I was happy that things were going well, but I felt like there was a necessity for change. And so I sat on the plane and just wrote out what could be the next idea, which was this story. And I wrote the whole basis for the Wild One story and the whole concept of Wretched Divine just on that flight in the notes section on my phone, uh, you know, back in the yellow notes section days where it was a very mm -hmm. cartoony font. Um, and then we landed and I sent it to everybody in our team, I said Blasco and uh, Richard, the, ar the artist, and, and just saying like, look, here is, here's what I wanna do, let's do this. So I got with Pat, I got with Richard, I said, let's develop this idea out. So then we started working on a script and the Bible for the story. And we started bouncing around ideas on how to develop this thing. And at the same time, the decision had already been made prior to us going on that tour that we were going to work with a producer named Sean Bevan. And I didn't know uh, that. he had done uh, Marilyn Manson and Nine Inch Nails and all this stuff. And we did a song for the first Avengers movie soundtrack mm -hmm. with Sean called Unbroken and we had a great time working with him and I had a really good time with him and it seemed like we really clicked. And then we, we went into to the concept of like, we're gonna do this record, right? And that, but that had already been decided. So we had like a two week, maybe a week and a half period between that tour ending and then us entering the studio to do record three with Sean. And um, he had already started working on tracking drums for demos that were very Set the World on Fire-esque songs. Uh, and at the same time, it had come up that uh, John Fun wanted to write with me. So I went out to John's house and we spent the day talking and going over influences and all that stuff. And I told him about the story that I wanted to build. And he was just fascinated by the idea. And I said, this is, you know, this record needs to be operatic and huge and, and have a lot of sounds and different instrumentation and all that. And of course, that's running completely in opposite directions of what is the initial tracking going on at the studio, which is essentially set the world on fire part two. You know what I mean? Um, and so I wrote uh, a little bit with, with John and then Jinx and Jake came out to John's studio and we did We Don't Belong, which was a song that ended up on the record. And we got the demo back for that. And it sounded exactly like how I thought Wretched and Divine should sound. So I'm listening to that song for three days or so. I'm driving around in my car listening to this demo going, this is the sound of this story. The weird instrumentation, the Danny Elfman type stuff, the, how big this chorus is, the fact that it's heavy, but it's not, it's not another one of these same records. The fact that it doesn't sound like an 80s hair metal band at all. The fact that it, it just is this other stuff. And so um, I, I had the unfortunate, unenviable task at 20 years old to walk into a, a studio and go up to a person that I very much liked and respected and say, hey, could we, uh, could we go outside for a little bit? And, uh, you know, I had to sit on the, on, the, on the pavement outside the studio and go, hey, um, I, uh, I don't think it's gonna work out here. Uh, 
you know, and by the way, I don't even know if Feldy can do the record yet at this point. <laughs> I've not contacted him. Yeah. So, so um, you, may be, you may be letting go parting ways with the producer you have and not. But I just knew that what we were making with him was not what the record should be. And I now have met this person who has the exact sound that I want the record to be. So I figured this is going to work out. I'm going to make this work out. So I go to Sean and I say, hey, uh, we're going to have to we're going to have to part ways very awkward situation where he goes into the studio and tells CC to stop tracking drums because he just got fired. And I'm just standing there, you know, and, and again, Sean's a wonderful person. We've seen him in years subsequently. There's no hard feelings there at all. Um, but yeah, so then it, it, then I, then I called Feldy and said, uh, Hey, uh, I just fired our producer on this record. Do you want to make this record? And he's like, wow, uh, this is crazy that you're calling me about this right now. But yeah, like I'm working on a record right now, but let's try to figure it out. And so from that point on, it just became, all right, let's, let's go work at John Feldman studio. So we were, we were already behind a few weeks or a month or so on the release, but then now I'm entering in a new producer. Obviously the budget is going to get cut down considerably because we, we're not going to take the money back money. from, yeah. yeah, we've already spent money on another producer. So Feldy's going to get a smaller amount than he would normally get. And we have less money to be able to pay for all of the things I want sonically to happen. But, and we've got limited time. So the, we, we must have missed like three separate release dates on that record that were already set in stone because of all the time that it took to do it. But I felt he just understood and believed in the concept. And even though we didn't have the resources to do it as big as we did, um, we were able to get it done. And then once the label heard it and understood it, uh, uh, Frank Arrigo, who was our product manager at the time, uh, at Universal basically gave us a, a blank check to do with what we wanted for the promotion. So we were able to somehow convince this label for which we had zero radio hits to give us basically the budget to make a, a film that we wanted to show in theaters uh, of the movie yeah. and to film it in this lake bed in, you know, El Mirage lake bed. And uh, by the way, you can hear my cat Femme, making cat noises. out. I don't know if you can hear it. She's very okay, loud, she's very upset. Uh, you can? I can't. Oh, well, she, she's out there. Uh, anyway, so we, we, we somehow got the ability to do that. And just every part of that became, um, the, to this day, it's the most uh, driven, I think, that I've ever been to, to just make a thing happen. You know, I'm, I'm 20. I've got a little bit of success. I've got new opportunities. And I've got this idea. And we're going to do it. And, you know, I watched back. My cousin Joe had filmed filmed every day in the studio and so we have all this footage from when we were making the record and the number of times where I do not have any tact when it comes to talking to people in the band or you know if anybody has any other ideas there's a there's a scene in the, in the documentary that we made where Jinx is talking about how he thinks Devil's Choir's uh, chorus might be a little bit too poppy and I just go oh yeah don't you fucking hate it when a song's good and you have to and you can sing along to it and I like <laughs> act like a dick and I you know like just not not nice, but I was just such a horse with blinders and just like, this is the thing. And it was, it was a divisive situation. You know, the band, the band at the time, and they would say this, wanted to make Set the World on Fire again. Jake wanted to make a heavy metal record. I wanted to make a rock opera that was more pop leaning when it came to its sensibilities. And I think what we got was something between the two. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why the record works the way it does. That's exactly what I was going to say, but you said it first. Um, and it was obviously um, a landmark for a few reasons. Um, and I, and, I, and I, like, I would like to mention that I said this long before it ever went gold, that I think it has the signature staple time capsule Black Veil song on it, which is a big deal. And it, of course, did become a gold single. And yeah, established that relationship with Feldman, which uh, ended up being a pretty important one in your life, you know professionally and, you know what's funny about in the end too is that that was the second song of that day we spent most wow. of that day working on a song that we all hated immediately but felt he was not ready to give up on uh and finally by like six o'clock i went up to felt and i said look we've got to just this is not going anywhere this song is not worth our time and he goes yeah you're probably right i just want to see if we could take it anywhere and i said we, we're not let's try something else and then we wrote in the end. Wow. You know, uh, I love and, those stories. And so, yeah, yeah, it was, kind of it was, a, it was, a, I mean, and that song came together fairly quickly. Um, and then it became clearly the single and became the song, but yeah, that was, 
we did not set out that day to write the single for the record. That was, that was a happy accident that occurred that way. Okay, so um, in the interest of time too, I'll, I'll speed us up a little bit, but we couldn't do Wretched and not talk about it as long as we did. Well, that's okay. I mean, as long as we're, I would say as long as we're done by like 4.15, 4.20. Okay, we will get there. Uh, yeah, perfect. Uh, so as the story goes, Bob Rock actually approached Blackville Brides and not the other way around, right? Like he heard he heard the band and, and reached out. And uh, as I know, you went to Swinger's Diner uh, to meet with Bob for the first time and were uh, starstruck by Matt Skiba, who was a couple booths away and thinking yes. about Matt Skiba the whole time and not really hearing what's being said. Uh, that aside, um, you know, there, there are a lot of distinctions between, first of all, for people watching this that may not understand, John Feldman and Bob Rock are two very different types of producers. They're both A-list, they're both multi-platinum records, you know, so on and so forth. But I would say if there's any, any way to really simplify it, I think Feldy is more of a lead vocal chorus kind of producer and Bob is more of a riff kick drum kind of producer. That just makes right out of the gate from uh, for a pretty starkly different environment creatively going from well, someone like Feldy I mean, also, and, also, yeah. and also doing the big opera rock opera with all the uh, instrumentation and and the different sounds and the kind of magic and trickery that you can do in a studio. And then to go with someone like Bob, who I know had you, you know, recording with a mic in your hand, running around the room like you would be on stage sort of thing. So yeah, tell me a little bit about some of those differences. And, I, and it's not a value judgment on either one of them as a producer or on a person, but just, it's just, a, it's a different way to make records. No, I mean, I would say, and, and I've always said that Bob is one of the kindest people I've ever worked with. Um, you know the, the joke we always say is he's a canadian who lives in hawaii like he's the he's the greatest combination of sweetness in the world yeah. um but you know he's he is a very different producer but that was also the intention i mean i think right after we did wretched and divine it felt like it didn't make a whole lot of sense right away to make another big concept record uh because what would you really do within a year you know what i mean like are you going to yeah. do there's a reason why, you know, in films, generally speaking, if two superhero movies of the same character come out within a year or two of each other, the second one tends to flop because the audience just needs time to build back up for that kind of thing. But with a band that's in kind of the prime of our career, the worst idea we could have had is to stay away for a number of years. So, you know, all things considered, it was a fairly long gap from 2012 to 2014. And, but that was about as long as you could really take for a release at that time, at least for us. And so um, the intention from the outset was to make a very different record and a, to a, try a to- pendulum swing, you know, to strip yeah. it down and make it more rock oriented and whatever. Yeah. And that's what we did. I mean, and, and, and look, there's, there was just as much magic and fun to be had when I'm standing on the phone talking to a Metallica biographer who works at Kerrang about what's it like to work with Bob and telling me all these stories about Bob and they're carrying in the SLS board that was used for the Black Album. Mm -hmm. And then we're getting ready to go to Vancouver to record on the desk that what they, what they did at Little Mountain or we're, we're, I'm walking into Henson Studios every day into the same room so that we can make sure that the signal chain for the amps is the same on the, as on the Black Album or I'm meeting the backup singers that sang on those records or whatever it is. Every day there was rock and roll magic. It was just a yeah. different thing. The songs were much more stripped down. The songs were written primarily in a rehearsal space, uh, not in the studio. You know, Bob, Bob wanted it to be, we, we can play everything and we can demo everything and we're gonna go to a rehearsal space and set up some mics and we're gonna do it this way and then we're gonna see what, what makes the cut. And- So really like genuine recorded... pre-production so when you're doing the actual production, it's performance-based. Right. And, you know, I'm recording vocals to an analog machine into Pro Tools. I'm recording on a handheld microphone and doing the entire song all the way through every time. You know, there weren't, there weren't, they didn't want to, you know, Bob and his engineer didn't want to do punching. So you're not, 
you're not singing a line and then getting a chance to breathe and then singing the next line. It was the entire song all the way through. So there's vocal, audible vocal fatigue by the final chorus on these songs. You know what I mean? Like there, there's yeah. things that were, that were fun and interesting. Um, I, it's not my favorite of our records. Uh, I, there's some of my favorite songs are on that record, but as a whole, I think the experience outweighed the product when it came to um, from track one to track 11 or 12 or whatever it is. Uh, there's a lot of really good material and there's a lot of stuff that suffered because a lot more time was spent being excited about the, the rock and roll dream than actually really working hard on some of the songs. There's a lot of, you know, and also I was in a very dark place in my life at the time. This is when the drinking to deal with uh, my upsets and the fears and anxieties that I had had become uh, a coping mechanism as opposed to a fun party time. So I'm drinking every day now. I didn't write the lyrics to a single one of those songs on that record, um, not inebriated. I would drink a bottle of red wine before I would sit to write every single night. Um, so in some cases you get songs that are a little bit nonsensical. The song like uh, uh, Sons of Night, I, you or me could not figure out what the hell I'm trying to say there. Um, you know, but by that same token, that was part of the whole idea. You know, it was meant to be this rock and roll record. So yeah, there's there's elements to that record that are great. I know a lot of people enjoy the record. It did. Bring this us is to, my favorite Black Bell Bride song still. Uh, and yeah, yeah, you know, Goodbye Agony is great. Like there's great Black Bell songs on that record for sure. I agree, and I think that I think that there's more there's more good than there's bad. Uh, but I think the low moments are some of the lowest moments that we have in the more modern era of the band because they fall really flat. And I think it's an inconsistent record in that way. Um, and I take, I take responsibility for that because there's a lot of times where I just didn't, I didn't have the emotional uh, stability to be able to sit and really, Faithless is a moment where I knew exactly what I wanted to say. Goodbye Agony is a moment where I knew, you walk away. These are songs that I, Devil in the Mirror, World of Sacrifice. There's a few songs on that record that are like really what I want to say. And then there's other times where I'm not really sure what the fuck I was talking about. You know what I mean? The Shattered God is a song like I can still listen to it now and go, yeah, I'm happy that I told that story in that way. Even if the world doesn't know what the story's about, I do and I can listen to it and know what I'm saying. Um, and yet there's other songs that just don't feel that way. But I would say that that experience was great. Um, the downside, of course, is that I remember the first time listening to heart of fire on the radio so the song before heart of fire is like this huge sounding right on the radio then our song comes on the radio and it's like this right in the center of your stereo and then the next song comes on and it's huge and that moment where i went oh we recorded an entire record in 2014 analog and it's it sounds like it's this big uh you know yeah. it was a little bit like ah oh. So there's moments that are great. There's moments that are not great. Overall, the experience of working with Bob was was wonderful. It was a dark time in my life. The tour for that record is the worst uh, emotional situation I've ever had. Um, there was a lot changing for me just personally, and I was dealing with a lot of emotional demons. And so there's good and bad there, you know. So this leads us into your debut solo record, and a little stopgap in between there is that first song. Um, they don't need to understand, which was kind of a runaway hit, so to speak. It's interesting, given that, you know, it didn't have like a big campaign behind it. It wasn't. It this... never appeared on an album or a radio. Right. Or, you know, right. And never, then, yeah. it's never been available on DSPs or anything. Right. So what, so what was the genesis of that? And how did that, how did that song end up happening outside the context of Black Bill? And then I was... into a solo record. I was unhappy in my life in general uh, with myself and I was particularly unhappy with some of the uh, elements in the band that I wanted to get away from, the particular personality type that I wanted to get away from. And I felt like I needed to find a lifeline out uh, because I couldn't figure out a way to fix the scenario. I was bound by obligation and other things to this situation within the band that we felt like there's no way to fix this. So what are we going to do? So for me, it became, well, I would very much like to continue to be a professional musician and I have other things to say. So Feldy and I started working on more eighties based music, you know, songs that were straight up breakfast club sounding songs. Mm -hmm. And 
that was maybe a little too on the nose, but the idea was there. So no one's ever really heard those songs, but they were fun and we thought, okay, maybe this is a thing. So then I started going, well, maybe this could be a thing. Um, you know, why don't I, why don't I start to pursue this? So then it was the Grammy weekend of that year. And I had a meeting with some of the people at, at, at the label that we were on at the time. And I said, Hey, I'd really like to do a solo thing, uh, in a more like 80 synth kind of thing. Uh, you know, Black Bell's been putting out records every single year. Uh, the band is burnt out just apart from the emotional issues that I had within the band. Um, we were burnt out. We had toured 10 months of the year for five years or four years at that time. So it was, it was time for a little bit of a break. And, uh, but I wanted to keep going with something. So I said, Hey, I'd like to do this. And they said, uh, no, why don't we just, why don't we just change the band uh, to just be you and you'll uh, make, and you'll make like synth based music in, instead of the music that you make. And I just, it was, it was just, I was so offended by the whole idea that they absolutely didn't understand at all what the band was or that that's not even a thing or, you know what I mean? It was just, yeah. it was a ridiculous premise. And, and, and so I and said- such a classic like record label mistake, like a massive error in judgment that affects your yeah. entire life and doesn't really affect- But of course, I mean, of course I, that was never even on the table. So right. I just, for me, I just, I just left that meeting going, well, that's stupid. So that's not gonna happen. So what do we do? So then the idea became, well, let's just, I had some of these songs demoed and I thought, well, if they're not going to let me make this, I'm bound to them contractually. They have the first rights to anything I release if I'm making money off of it. So I can't release songs on my own and make money, but theoretically I could release this song as a, as a, the soundtrack to a video of myself for free on YouTube and they wouldn't be able to do anything about it. So we contacted Hot Topic at the time and we said, hey, we're gonna make merchandise and we're gonna give you the exclusive on this, but we're, we're gonna film the video. So Pat and I filmed the video. We went to Richard's art, art gallery and filmed a lot there and we walked around the parking lot there and walked around on Miracle Mile and Fairfax, just, just fucking making a video with a camera and a handheld light and a song that was essentially a demo. And we put that out and, it, and you know, within a couple of weeks, this, it had done really well. And then we get a call from the label like, hey, Boy, that solo thing is a great idea. We should we should make an Andy Black record. So, um, you know, so that was basically, yeah. and that you know, and and to be clear, that that basic premise is true of the entire time that I'm doing Andy Black with that label. They, you have to understand when you trick someone into signing you, you can't be super. You can't expect a whole lot when it comes to them getting the project. You know what I mean? Um, so I don't think that. The shadow side, I remember when I thought, I, there was about a week time where I thought, oh, this is a great record. I think the label's really going to get it. And then I remember having like a phone call and leaving that, but going, nope, they don't understand it at all. All right, well, we'll just keep moving. Um, and so that was, that's kind of been the story. But the shadow side became a situation where uh, I just wanted to do this and felt he was into it. And we just said, let's make this the best possible record we can. Let's collaborate with everyone that we can. It was as dark as the times were prior to that, that was like the light, you know, that made me love making music again. And that made me feel like it wasn't all dark and terrible, and that there was joy to be had in having Gerard Way come in or Patrick Stump or just all these people every day, writing, singing, playing, collaborating. Um, you know, it, it was just, it, it was a really, really wonderful experience. And it got my passion back for making music. Brilliant. And yeah, and, and to go from what's starting to feel like a restrictive situation creatively and interpersonally and all that to, yeah, then being unbound and just being able to collaborate, like you said, with all, you know, musical heroes and peers and, you know, and, and obviously the relationship that you had established with Feldman had become pretty close at that point. And that leads us um, quite easily into the second solo record, which... Um, well, actually, Veil came out before it. So, which one do you want to go with? Wow, it did, huh? Yeah. But did you? But was the Ghost of Ohio recorded before Veil? No. So, and actually, the way that it works is, Veil started in uh, December of 2016, and wasn't released until January of 2018. We finished. We finished uh, not December of 2016. December of 2015. So we finished uh the um shadow side record and it's done uh -huh. and i'm going to be touring it that spring and summer but with 
within a week, Jake and Jinx come to Feldy's and we say, let's get started on the next Black Belt record. Okay, and I do remember that. So we start recording that and it takes several years to finish it. But I, and then I go on tour for the shadow side and all that stuff. So yeah, it actually goes, the, the order of, of, of recording goes shadow side directly into Vale and then Vale almost directly into uh, the Ghost of Ohio. That's probably why they're overlapping so much in my mind. For some reason in my mind, I'm, I'm now remembering Ghost of Ohio coming out before Veil. Vale. No, there there was almost <laughs> Ghost weird. of Ohio came out last spring, and there was almost no break in between that like four year period, basically. Yeah. So Veil, vale, um, for all intents and purposes, thematically, lyrically, um, you know, even down to the the album title and and a lot of the the, the symbolism and the imagery that with the whole thing, was very much closing a chapter for you in your life and in your career and for the band, um, kind of revisiting some of the threads of some of the stories from earlier records, but also putting a, uh, what at the time I think could easily have been interpreted as a very definitive end point, regardless of what was gonna come next. Well, so, I mean, it was uh, never talked no. about, but it was, it, was the, it was as close to the idea that, it, it, I wouldn't say it was never talked about, it was never decided, but, I certainly felt like it had the opportunity or the chance to be the final record from the band. Um, it was written with that in mind to a certain degree. The last song on the record is essentially my goodbye to this thing that I created when I was 16 years old. Um, and it's still to this day a hard song to listen to for me because, I mean, I remember the first time I played it for my parents, I cried, even though I fucking tracked it and had sang it. And I, they don't, I mean, we were sitting in the car and I was playing it and I like got emotional just because it, it broke my heart. The whole concept and the whole idea of, of an ending broke my heart, but there was just, there was an element that we needed to, that we couldn't move past. And if we couldn't get past that, then it had to end because we couldn't, we couldn't be that anymore. And it, it, it was heartbreaking and it felt terrible but I just didn't know another way to do it. And so um, it felt like it was the end. There's so many songs on that record. And, you know, there's also songs that are very personal to me. That was when I was really committed and to being sober and not drinking mm -hmm. at all. And I was in a very delicate place in my life. Songs like um, When They Call My Name, it's literally just about, you know, my, my relationship with Juliet and needing to have that person that you can talk to about these things and the, and the demons that were constantly coming out of me and the feeling of like, my God, I've spent the last half a decade drunk. And you know, what, what kind of situations did I get myself into? And what kind of, what kind of things did I say or do that, you know, you're, you're trying to remember all these things of, that you can't because you had poisoned yourself into not being there anymore. So it's, it's a very scary time. And so that's what that song is about. But a primary function of the record was the catharsis of saying goodbye to this element. And also the way that I was able to do that was to also end the storyline that had started on Wretched and Divine. And so while it was never publicly known by the audience that this was the last record, it also just was the last record in the sense that, you know, um, Jake recorded his guitar parts in his studio, Jinx recorded his stuff in his studio. I recorded my vocals in uh, Felty's studio, CC recorded his drums in Felty's studio but none of us were ever in the same room. Um, maybe more than two days, you know? And, you know, it was, you would get the song done and it, it wasn't because we hated one another. It was just that the band had become so disjointed and there just wasn't a connection there that we were just getting it done, you know? There, and, and the songs would be there and then the idea would come up and then, you know, it, but it was never done in a way of like, everybody's in a room and work left. It was the exact opposite of Russian and Divine. And it's very hard to make a concept record, but not everyone's in on the concept or not everyone's there right. for all those things. You know, the reason that Wretched and Divine works is because it was such a collaborative effort and there was so much about it that was a collaboration. Um, but again, the breaks that I had taken from the band, and the fact that the Andy Black situation being what it was, it just felt like maybe this is the only way forward. And if that's the case, then we have to go out 
on a with a with a great send off, mm-hmm. and you know that was the plan. You know, I remember coming up with ways that I could say things that you know would would indicate stories or experiences I was having and things I couldn't talk about. You know, um, and so that for me was an important record, but it was also a very while if 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 the shadow side is me coming out of drinking and, and getting happy veil vale is me going through that second wave of emotion of well now that i've gotten out of that what do i do now you know where's my life go now um am i going to lose this thing that has been the most important part of my professional life and on an emotional level one of the most important things in my life since i was a literal teenage boy you know um and so it was just a very dark time and so uh I was very proud of the record. I still am. I know it's not everybody's favorite record. Um, it's one that is very divisive with our fans. Some people love it. Some people absolutely can't stand it. Like most of our records, it did about 50% good, 50% bad with the critics. You know, that, you know that's, that's kind of the way that our, our records tend to go anyway. Um, there was, I was surprised at how many people talked about how commercial it was. Uh, but I guess in some ways, a lot of that also comes down to the fact that it's a little bit more of a, and, and not, people aren't wrong when they say this, it's more of an Andy Black, Black Belt Brides record, because that's kind of where I was at emotionally and, and as a songwriter at the time. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that there's not much to say about the studio experience because there wasn't really a studio experience. Yeah. Well, you know what's, uh, what I think a great analogy is for that record is like the uh, season finale of a show that could be the series finale when like right. the creative team doesn't know whether or not they're getting renewed. So they make the season finale as though, well, if this is the last episode ever, we feel good about it. Right. But we hope there's another season. And then, yeah. you know, thankfully for all of us, uh, you know, Blackfield Brides was renewed <laughs> for further seasons. Yeah. But that could have, had that been the send off, it could have stood as, you know, a proper ending to, to the whole thing. Yeah. Um, so, uh, let's see if we, let's see if we can do two and a half more records. I think we can. Um, Ghost of Ohio was another opportunity in some respects to, uh, do something conceptual and thematic and to, uh, you know, put your name on a graphic novel for the first time, which is an, there were, there were a lot of firsts happening for you in that era. Um, Let's talk about Ghost of Ohio a little bit. And, and also there were, in terms of broadening your horizons, um, I would say even more influences and, and different shades and colors creatively than even the first solo record, let alone the Blackfell stuff. Well, I, w- I would say also that an important part of the Ghost of Ohio is that the Black Veil tour cycle for Veil lasted about six months. Yeah. Um, and not a lot of shows within that six months. There was there was some stuff that had happened uh, where I just was done. You know, I, I couldn't I was touring in a separate band or I was touring in a separate bus uh, I, I, from the band. And I, I I would only really see them when I went on stage. Um, I just felt like the, the what what everything that I had dreamt the band to be had had been distorted and it just didn't feel like it was fun anymore um and sometimes fun isn't your job uh but if you can if you can find a way to make something fun that's obviously more preferable so i thought well we did those roxy shows and there was some you know again i i, I can't get into it too much but there there was there was ele- there was an element that just didn't didn't really mesh anymore and it just felt like, well, I'm just going to go do an Andy Black record and just move on, you know, because I, I have to tour to make a living. I have to do this. So I'll just go back to that. And, um, you know, that was the initial kind of the initial thought as well as do another one of those. Right. Because I have to make a living. I have to do this and I want to be creative. So I'll just do that. That was the basis. And there was almost no motivation at the beginning of the record to 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 do anything. I would go into Feldy Studio and we'd write something. And I'd go, okay, fine. You know, it's not blowing me away. And then one of the days came along where we started to work on a song and the phrase, uh, the ghost of Ohio came up. 
And because I've always, I've for years, I wrote a song years ago with some friends that was the king of yesterday. I've always loved the concept of there's a certain personality type, especially within our field of, of the world that is obsessed with nostalgia and romanticizing the past. And I think to a certain degree, at different phases of my life, I've re, re-remembered situations or romanticized them in a way that wasn't how they really were, or people or friends or whatever it is. And so I always love that situation or that idea for a song of like this person who's obsessed with the things that have faded away and be able to re reevaluate those situations with your own narrative that you're writing onto it. And so that was kind of the basis for the idea. And then it became, well, what if this is actually a character that just goes around where they used to live and doesn't have any connection with anybody, but just remembers the great times, even though there weren't any, you know what I mean? Just making up a version of events where everything's great and everything's fine. Um, and that was the basis. So we did a song, Ghost of Ohio, which was initially just a piano and vocal ballad and didn't really go anywhere. It was, the lyrics were great in my opinion and the idea was great, but the song didn't go anywhere. And I remember, you know, playing it for, for Juliet and other people. And, just, and when I would listen to it, I'd just be like, this is not really, it's not enough, right? But the, the idea was there. And then all of a sudden, we're, we're sitting around for a while, a couple months past, we're trying to figure out what we're going to do what's this record going to be more time goes by writing more songs and one day i was sitting we had moved and i was sitting in our new place and i all of a sudden just had this idea of well what if the ghost of ohio was a character and this record is a story and similar to wretched divine so i just started writing it and i wrote the whole story of who this character is you know we had we were working on uh, the book a lot of the time so i had a lot of ideas about my childhood and growing up in Cincinnati and ideas about that part of the world. And, and we were delving into a lot of the sort of unknown, creepy shadow side underbelly of Ohio. That there is, you know, right. you, don't, you don't think of Ohio as a gothic, spooky place, but there are actually, in fact, as people will read in the book, um, a lot of cool, crazy, creepy, supernatural-ish stories. Yeah, and places that I spent the bulk of my childhood. Uh, yeah. Most of which show up in the Ghost of Ohio video that Pat and I did, where we went to those places and filmed them. Um, but yeah, so it, I then I took, you know, like the uh, the shelves in a closet that are like wood pieces that slide into place and they like mm -hmm. stack up. I pulled one of those out of the closet uh, up here and I grabbed a bunch of paint and I painted this big wood white wood piece with this character because I I don't know why, but I was like, oh, I need to paint it. So I painted this green faced monster character who had an eye patch and instead of a missing eye he had an eye patch and uh i just took a picture of it and i sent it to feldy and blasco and everybody and said this is the record this is what we're doing let's scrap everything that we've got and start over and so that's what we did and then it became the race to try to make that record be that story and get that done at the same time i got hit up by a mutual friend of ours josh bernstein who said hey i'm working with this company uh, w would you ever think about doing a comic book? And this is literally like a day after I wrote the treatment for Ghost of Ohio. And I said, actually, yesterday I wrote a treatment for a comic book. Um, let's do this. So then within a day of that, I'm on a call with an artist and the publishers and everything else. So it, that it went from apathy about just making a record so that I could stay alive kind of thing to full on excitement about making this record about this story and all that kind of stuff. And then, you know, putting it out. And then the truth of the matter is that that tour cycle was one where um, by the summer of last year, uh, by like June of last year, I was really angry that I had let a, a something take away this band mm -hmm. that I had, that I had allowed something to, to get in the way and, and make it more difficult and make it impossible to continue. And, and while I understood that it would be very difficult to change that, and I knew that there was a nearly impossible uphill climb to get the things changed that we needed to get changed, I was, I was dedicated to the idea that that's what I was gonna do. Rather than ending the band, it was to fix this problem. And so I called up the guys and I said, look, um, I, I, wanna, I, I wanna fix this. Like I wanna, I wanna do what we should do and it's time. And I know it's going to be hard and I know it's going to be a long and difficult and an arduous process, but we've got to, got to do what we have to do. And so we just started 
talking every day. You know, while I was on that tour, I'd be texting ideas. And we decided, hey, you know what? We've been floating around this idea of this 10 year anniversary re-recording for a number of years. Um, let's just really commit. Let's really do it. You know, let's let's get it done. Let's let's have Jake produce it. You know, and and then also also on that tour, I I started to to get to know Lonnie, and Lonnie seemed like this wonderful person. So it's just all that stuff kind of convalesced into where it ended up. But I can remember being in, uh, well, I think it was Atlantic City Warp Tour. You're on the beach, tons of people. And I was, and I don't mean to say this to sound like, woe is me, I get to play in front of a bunch of people. But I had a, I had a sense of just apathy to the whole thing. Because as that tour went on, I more and more wanted that, my solo band to be like a rock band. I wanted to play rock music on stage. Right. Again. And I was upset that this band that I created when I was very young was no longer my means of doing that or seemed like it wasn't going to be moving forward. And I just didn't want to accept that. And so I can remember before that show, I was telling Julia, like, I don't, I'm not feeling this anymore. I'm not feeling just my initials being on the stage. You know what I mean? Like I want, I want to be part of a band. Um, and so that became the, that became the catalyst for like, let's do this. And then we got together and obviously we, we were in the position we're in now and we put together, uh, restitch these wounds and now we're working on a new record and the band's in the best place we've ever been in. And, um, yeah, but the ghost of Ohio is important for a couple of reasons. One, because it was, it's a record that I love. I got to, I got to make songs that sounded like Bruce Springsteen and all the influences that I have, um, it was my final record with Universal, so I was able to get out of that deal and do so on good terms and not, you know, not mad at anybody or anything, be able to just move on. Um, and it was my first opportunity to make a comic book and to make a story come to life that way in my own way about emotions and about concepts and ideas that I had felt my whole life but was never able to really say through music. Yeah, and to go to San Diego Comic-Con to promote your comic book. <laughs> yeah, I got to do a signing at San Diego nice. Comic-Con. I got to do a panel at New York Comic-Con. Like. Yeah my first time at either of those events and uh you know i got to be way to go for the first time (laughs) yeah yeah as a as a i mean like everything else in your life as a contributor to the things you love a participant not just an audience member or observer um which i think speaks a lot to your the arc of your career as, as it's continued um so we should talk about the vengeance and saints of the blood because so those were important yeah so and I, and I think some of, some of the things that you've said about some of the other records um, comes full circle even with those two songs because I think having done the solo records, having gone through some of the push and pull of the different Black Veil records, I feel like those two songs are extraordinarily pure examples of like, we're going to just do something that sounds like Black Veil Brits. Like full yeah, I mean, the intention there... The intention there was to to write two songs that just felt like if we could just get into a time capsule to where we were at in 2010, 2011, and just make songs without any outside influence, no no outside producer, no we had no label at the time. You know, it was before we signed again. We were kind of just in this limbo period where we were like, we have no one to answer to. Let's just make before we sign again because we had offers, but before we sign anywhere again, let's just do this and and you know, we can present whatever label we're going to. And ultimately that was Sumerian with these two songs. Go, look, here's some material. Let's release this right away. Um, but that just, a lot of it, I would give Lonnie a huge amount of credit for that in the sense that we, being around him has had invigorated all of us to, to get back to what the band was, you know. Because and you just, and again, he has that insiders and outsiders perspective that he can now offer from within. Yeah, I mean, and also, I mean, just the fact that Jake is, has become such a, a great producer and mixer and engineer and, and just, you know, same thing with Jinx. And we, we've just, we've grown so much as a band that it was, we knew that we could just do it on our own. You know, we knew we could just make these songs, make these videos on our own, no outside budget, no outside influence, just making it, recording it, putting all of our own resources into putting it out and everything else. Um, and, you know, thankfully, we were able to, to go to Sumerian and say, look, we've got these songs and they got behind it. You know, they let us release it. You know, that was before we had ever really even finalized a record deal with them. But those songs came out. You know, we hadn't really officially even signed yet. So, of course, credit to Ash and everyone at Sumerian for that. Um, 
but yeah, that, I mean, the recording of those was, let's write some Black Veil songs. We had some riffs sitting around. The riff for The Vengeance was, uh, dates all the way back to um, Russian and Divine. It was a riff called Burns Like Hell, I think. And then we just could never figure out what to do with it because it was so intense that it was like, at the time that we were working on Russian Divine, we wanted to strip everything down. And then we tried to do something with it again for the fourth record, but it just didn't fit. So it was this riff that was sitting around about 40% of that riff that ended up in The Vengeance was sitting around. And then Jinx had some ideas and then that was how that one was built. And then Saints of the Blood was all these new riff ideas and it was just, it started to kind of sm snowball. And then that became, well, let's just keep writing. And so now here we are a couple of months later and we've got six complete songs apart from those two and about 12 ideas of songs you know so i mean and we're and this week as we're speaking i'm going to be in the studio every single day this week working so you know we're the plan is to get a new record done and to get it out there probably first quarter of next year and is this being made the same way with with jake at the helm as producer we've what we've been doing is we've been working with jake is primarily doing the production and stuff but we've also been working with eric ron uh, a lot who's great um friends with cc we've worked with him um, but primarily, yes, we've been we've been working at Jake's studio. I mean, I've been at Jake's house every day this week, uh, singing and recording all, new material and, and songs. That's awesome. So, lastly, as we're talking about this right now, um, "Sweet Blasphemy" is the first real taste of restitch that fans have gotten, and they say never read the comments. But I was reading through some of the YouTube YouTube comments within the first few hours of it being released, and one of the things that fans were commenting on the most that I kept coming across was how great your vocals sound and how um, it's a very different, different response to when that folder. song was put out 10 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> what, so, so what was, I mean, what was that like knowing that you were going to have a chance? Cause there, there's not many times in life when we get to go back and redo something, you know, especially something yeah. so important. like, what was that experience being able to, well, that, the, the germ of this idea started with working with Feldy because he, he taught me different parts of my voice that I was not previously able to access or didn't know how to use. So after we'd read in the Vine, hardcore Black Belt fans might remember that we, we, we tried to start an online campaign for ourselves to do We Stitch These Wounds in 2013. Uh, and we were trying to do it and trying to see if our audience would help us put pressure on our previous label to let us do it. And ultimately, they just they didn't they were not interested in having something that would compete with their existing release. So once once the contract, the statute of limitations on that contract had ended, and we were able to do it, we always knew we wanted to do this because just for me vocally, for Jake in terms of production, for all these things, we knew that we could do that record better. As far back as 2013, we knew we could do that record better. And CC had now, always wanted to play a bunch of those songs. <laughs> yeah, CC yeah. did not was not on that album, and yeah. so you know, and we had played a fair number of them live and he had made changes and we were preferring the way that the songs were sounding live. Sweet Blasphemy is a song that we played for years. Um, it's in the Live and Burning DVD, I think, but it's not, it's not the version that's on the record, you know, so we wanted to do that version. I've made slight alterations to the melodies in almost all of these songs over the years. Um, a song like Never Give In, where it basically doesn't have a melody, it's just nonsense. That was a song where I was like, I could write this, like I can rewrite this and make this make sense. So there's some songs that have not drastic changes, but changes in the sense that the melody is being rewritten to make more sense. And then there's other songs where we really just remain true to the original recording. A song like Knives and Pens, we just made it better and bigger and better, but it's, it's not the Knives and Pens that you've listened to for the last decade plus. It's just a, a more sonically sound version of that song. Um, same thing with Perfect Weapon or other things like dumb things. Like Perfect Weapon, some people might be upset to learn that we took the w laugh, uh, witch laugh out of the bridge in Perfect Weapon. Because uh, it just, again, we've just never liked it or it wasn't, you know, stuff like that we were able to change. But by and large, and then a song like Carolyn is a song that was supposed to be huge. It's a big, it's a monster rock ballad. That was the intention. And it just sounds very small in the record. So having a chance to do all that again. But yeah, from a vocal standpoint, to re-record everything, to have the chance to sing now at 29 years old, these songs that I sang at 19 years old or 18 years old, um, I just feel like I have a better grip, grip, grip on the material. And I think um, one last thing to, to say about Restitch, 
that uh, you and I, as as fellow obsessives about different things in pop culture, you know, there's that old adage and it gets misattributed to all sorts of different people over the years, but there's that thing where people are like, you know, this remake, it, it ruined the original or this, uh, you know, this movie ruins the book or no, the original, the book is still on your shelf. The original record is still yeah. on your hard drive. It's still, you know, nothing's ruined, nothing's replaced. It's well, and that's why we wanted to make that really clear. I, I said it the other day. Yeah. This is not a replacement for We Said She's Wounds. It's, it's meant to be a companion piece. You know, if you yeah. if you like that record, it's a director's cut. You, <laughs> yeah, and you'd be interested to hear how we would have intended for that record to go. Right. You know, this is the this is the hashtag release the Black Veil Brides cut of. of <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and uh, fortunately in Restitch, uh, Han Solo still shoots first. On the important yes. stuff is, yeah. is in yeah. there. All, yeah, all the important stuff. And we, yeah, and we haven't, Hayden Christensen does not show up on the record <laughs> at any point. Uh, well, on that note, my friend, thank you so much for making the time to do this. Um, it was just as fun as I knew it would be, just as insightful. Um, I think even for uh, longtime fans and super fans of everything you've done, there's some new things for them to learn from what we just talked about, so. Appreciate yeah, that. I mean, the, the more that I get to talk about this kind of stuff, I've never been, had a chance to kind of go into every single record. So I think there's probably quite a few things that I've said today that no one's ever heard me say before. So there's you know. even <laughs> stuff that you've said that we hadn't talked about for the book. So yeah, <laughs> bonus. Um, bonus. Awesome. Well, thanks again. And um, All right. I'm sure I'll talk to you 10 minutes from now. Thanks, bud. I'll talk to you in a few minutes. <laughs> All right. Later. Bye.